All right, ladies, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to get through probably the first 11 verses. It's kind of on the heels of what we talked about last time. This is like the rapture part two. Um, and um, just exciting to see. When you, when you parallel these texts with today's news events, it's really, is it really like watching a movie, you know, that's been written off the, the text itself. So, all right, let right, let me just read through the first 11 verses and then we'll go back and we'll talk through some things. Um, now as to the times and the epics, or the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need of anyone, anything, excuse me, to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. You are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but be, let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith, sound familiar, and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are also doing. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, you remember that, that Paul got on this topic because he, he had not had sufficient time to explain it all to them. And they were very concerned about their, what, what happens to their loved ones when they die before the rapture happens. And he's assuring them that when the Lord comes for the church, the dead in Christ rise first, get their, their glorified bodies. We all get caught up then. We get our new version and we're with the Lord you know, for that seven year period of time referred as the 70th week of Daniel's, one way of putting it, the latter part of which is the time of Jacob's trouble, tribulation down here, whatever you want to call it, okay? That's happening down here. So, you know, he talks about the trumpet in uh, chapter four, the archangel. We looked at the parallels between the Jewish wedding custom and what was laid out in chapter four. And you know, as he's focusing still on the rapture, he's also, he's already taught them about the times and the seasons, for they realize that the day of the Lord is going to be like a thief in the night. Now, that's an interesting illustration in two, two ways. We know that, you know, if, if a thief's going to rob my house, daytime's actually better, I'm home at night. Well, not always. But most thieves would, will, they want the cover of darkness, don't they? Okay. They want the cover of darkness. People are asleep. They tiptoe in. They get what they want, and they leave. Okay, but it's it's you're not expecting it. If 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 a thief is coming and you know it and you see it on your surveillance system, you're prepared, right? But if you don't see them and you come in, and damage is done. Okay, it's unexpected. It's sudden, and all of that. But there's an interesting thing that happens in the in there's a in the priest hood in the temple and there was a priest and generally it was either the the high priest himself or it was called the captain of the guard <clears throat> a priest had that role and they would patrol the temple at unknown times to make sure that the priests on third shift or so were awake okay if you remember in the temple you have the altar of sacrifice and on that altar is a fire and that fire is to get burning all the time so you constantly had to stoke it, add wood, whatever they were burning, most likely wood, had to be kept going. They were not allowed to let it go out. And so there were certain priests on, on duty, that's their job. And imagine you got third shift duty. What are you tempted to do? Take a nap. You'd nap, not off. And so the captain of the guard or the high priest at any time they could come around on patrol to see if you're awake. And what they would do if they catch you sleeping is they would take a torch and light it, and then they'd light the hem of the garment 
Uh-huh. And then the person who's lit up has a fire lit under them. Guess where that came from? Is running out of the temple, stripping their clothes off. And it's a very embarrassing thing. You know, that's the only, they didn't, I guess they didn't have the slogan, stop, drop, and roll. But, you know, it, it, having a fire lit under you comes from this. I, I'm, look, I'm presuming that. I did not actually read that that's where it came from. But it certainly fits, doesn't it? That captain of the guard and that priest, that they were known as the thief in the night. Okay, that's what they were known as in the temple. Okay, that thief in the night would come in. It, it's, a, it's a metaphor, it's, a, it's a, a term that was used in the temple for the priest who would come around to see if you were sleeping or if you were carrying out your duties to keep the fire going on the, on the altar. So at least the, the, the Jews of Thessalonica would have understood that imagery, but that's, that's one of the reasons where that term came from. I quickly looked at the cross-references. Anyway, I have a, a letter B mm -hmm. right in front of that last phrase. It just says, so that means like in the New Testament, it must be either referring to the thief in the night or is it saying maybe about the, the high priest and the... Um, you mean where that reference is there? <clears throat> It should, uh, there should be a Bible verse connected with that yeah, letter B. There's a lot of them. I'm just saying so okay. elsewhere in the New Testament talking about thief in night, but it's also thinking about what you just said about the, mm -hmm. the high priest and the, um, the control guy or whatever. Captain of the guard. Captain of the guard thing. I don't know if that's referenced in Scripture. It could be in Old Testament. They could be. It could be. I just know that that's, I found, I read that a long time ago and I checked it again for class to make sure I wasn't recollecting incorrectly um, but that is is certainly something that you know is well known in the Jewish community and you know if you read other people teaching on the text they reference this so it is a known it is a known thing but it wouldn't surprise me I don't again I I am not a concordance but I, I believe it that I, I have not read that that was instructed to the high priest to light them up if they're, I think that's just a way they came up with um, to keep them awake. But Thief of the Night is definitely uh, referenced throughout scripture. <coughs> mm -hmm. But it's also, let's go back to the Jewish wedding ceremony. It's also something where that groom would come in like a thief in the night and steal away the bride. So there's two points of correlation there. You know, what the priest would do in the priesthood and then the groom, that whole wedding ceremony situation where the, where the father would tell the bridegroom, go get her, trumpets would be blown, and he would, it, it obviously wasn't secret, but it was something that was used as a metaphor. You know, he's gonna come steal his bride away, which is, makes perfect sense why um, they would use that illustration. Um, verse 3. What's, what's in the headlines? Peace and, safety. Peace, and safety, peace and safety. What's in our headlines? Okay. Um, when you think about what's going on today, um, that peace and safety is if you're in Israel, if you listen to Amir Safadi or any of these other guys that are over in Israel a lot, and of course Amir is from there, lives there, um, and whenever he's got a tour group out, he does a video and he asks the people, you know, how you feeling? Do you feel safe? Do you feel, because people will say to you, you're going to Israel now, what are you, crazy? It's ground zero. And so he'll have his tourists uh, say, yeah, this is great. We've not felt threatened at all. It's great. But anybody should come and all that. Israel has a very strong defense. They have Iron Dome, which allegedly can shoot down and has shot down missiles coming in from Gaza or from the Golan or, or wherever they're targeting them. Um, but if you ask the typical Jew around Tel Aviv or Haifa or any of these other cities, they feel safe. Peace and safety. Now, what have we just had rolled out um, a couple of months ago? 
What was unveiled? No, 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 think weapon. Peace and safety. The Trump peace plan, right, okay? Yeah. And more and more Middle Eastern nations are seeing the wisdom in it and are jumping on board saying, yeah, we like this. There are far more in the category of supporting this treaty than are against it. With Israel? Oh, yeah. The Middle East? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, Trump, Trump unveiled a peace plan. It's actually very favorable for, for Israel. Now there are those who, who aren't, there, there are certain aspects of it that they don't agree with or don't like. But um, number one sticky point is that, that the Palestinians would have any kind of capital called East Jerusalem. Um, but you know, this peace plan is, is there, it hasn't been ratified, okay? But it's on the table. Okay, and as uh, one teacher would put it, the, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. This is an opportunity that would tremendously be benefit the Palestinian people, but the Palestinian leadership, which is a proxy of Iran and Hezbollah, the only solution for them is that Israel would be annihilated. They would, because part of the peace plan is for them to have to acknowledge Israel as a sovereign nation, and they will refuse to do that. So this peace plan won't get off the ground until they're willing to capitulate to that, but they're not going to. So the current situation right now in Israel, they just had elections yeah, this past that. week. <laughs> now everybody, their initial reaction, when I say everybody, I mean the conservative side of things, was excited because Netanyahu wins big and he gets 60 seats. And they have a parla British type parliamentary system. You have to have, uh, just because he wins the election doesn't mean that he's the prime minister. His party has to have enough seats to form a coalition, okay? When you think about the word coalesce, you have to come together. In other words, they have to, you think about the, the Senate. Why are we happy that the Republicans have the Senate? Because they have more seats than the Democrats so that they can control what's being voted up and down, right? That's kind of like the situation in the parliament. Netanyahu needs to have enough seats to form a coalition. He only has 60 seats. He needs one more. And these other parties are trying to, um, and they're trying to kick him out. They're basically saying, we won't, we won't capitulate. We won't send our delegates to you. We won't give our, our parliamentary members to you, our backing to you, unless Netanyahu is not the prime minister. And they tried to pass legislation this week. I don't know if they were successful or not. They may have been. They tried to pass a law saying if you've been indicted, you can't be prime minister. And remember, they, they tried to indict him on accepting campaign gifts of cigars and champagne from a friend. That's what they accused him, cigars and champagne. Really. Yeah, that's how much they hate him. Um, it's visceral. You can tell how much they hate this guy. And, and they themselves, they, are Israelites. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I You've got to, uh, uh, one of the things I don't think we comprehend, I know it's hard for me, is that the Israelites are not, today's Israel is a compilation of nations, okay? They've come from Russia, they've come from all over the world and come from different styles of government. And they don't, a lot of them don't understand what it's like to have a republic like we do where you're representative and they're used to socialism, a lot of them. And they're used to getting handouts. They're used to getting free this, free that, free the other thing. And they'll side with these more liberal parties that, that want to capitulate and give land for peace. Land for peace has never worked. And God has stipulated, you will not divide up my land. This is not going to work for you guys. Okay. 
So even though they're prospering like never before, they're making medical breakthroughs right and left. They're making a lot of money. Oh, and they have the, the fourth, I think the third or fourth highest GDP of any nation in the world, and they're this little tiny nation. They are prospering left and right under Netanyahu's rule and leadership. But for some reason, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> so they're in a situation where they cry peace and safety. And they think they're on the right track. Economics, what will happen? This sudden destruction will come upon them. Here's where, again, people get really confused. Is it mid-trip, post-trip? Who, who's the sudden destruction coming upon? Them, not us. Okay, the pronouns are important here. While they're crying peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them like birth pangs on a, upon a woman. I, now again, I have not given birth and I thank God for that. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen it with horses, I don't ever wanna do it. Um, <laughs> when it starts, it starts suddenly, doesn't it? And then when it starts, it doesn't what? It doesn't quit. It increases in intensity until birth is given, right? Um, so he's like, it's going to come suddenly like birth pains on a woman with child, and, and they will not escape. There's no escape. There's no stopping giving birth. There's no escape from what's going to happen. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. Ooh, that's really good. It's not, we have all these signs to see. Okay? It should not catch us by surprise. If the rapture happened today, I would not be surprised. Because everything's in place. Temple's ready to go. They, they just, that, remember the temple is going to be rebuilt during the 70th week of Daniel. It's not going to be in place before we leave. Now, what is going to happen? What is the destruction that's going to come upon them? When the rapture happens, what do you think the ramifications are of the rapture? Who's the number one world economy? China? Could be. I don't know. If it's not China, it's us. Okay? What, is, what effect is the rapture going to have on the United States of America? The economy. It's going to crash the economy. If you crash the American economy, what else goes? Many. Others. All the rest. Okay, Europe won't feel much, but Europe's a mess as it is, okay? China will feel it because there's a lot of them, a lot of believers that are secret believers, but they got enough people to fill in the gap quickly, okay? The United States will collapse. If our government, our, our economy collapses, it's going to take the rest of the world with it. Fear and panic are going to prevail. Imagine, especially in the United States, the riots, the anarchy, the okay. Um, there are going to be fatalities. There will be fatalities. Cars are driving along, and believers are gone. Airplanes will crash. There will be Ameri uh, believing pilots who will. It will happen. Um, tractor trailers. There's going to be fatalities along with this, okay. And the primary explanation is going to be alien abduction, alien invasion. Okay. And again, I don't have time to get down this rabbit hole. But the enemy has set up mankind to believe that aliens have come and taken us. We're negative energy, keeping them from harmonizing their positive energy, so they're taking us out. It's called the cleansing in the New Age philosophy. It actually has a name. Okay, and so he'll be there to sell them on that. And it's going to leave a vacuum. Right now, Donald Trump's pretty much, you know, calling a lot of shots. You know, there's a lot of people that argue, no, he's not the world leader. But he is probably, if you think about it, the most powerful man in the world. Take him out. Take the leadership out. You're left with, again, if, if we were to be raptured today, and Lord, that would be great, but from my perspective, that's a totally selfish statement. Donald Trump, most likely gone, because I believe he has come to faith. Pence, a professing believer, who's president? Pelosi, 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. We're not going to be here. But that's what you're left with. You're going to be left with Pelosi and Shifty Schiff and, and, and Schumer and all those guys that are, are going to be calling the shots. And they're, they're going to be the ones that have to pull everything together. Are they going to be able to? No. It's going to be a mess. The but you indicates the church is gone. We're gone. There's a mess that's left behind. That day shouldn't catch us by surprise. We are of the light, not of the darkness. We need to live in that light and walk in that light. We're not to be asleep. That's another analogy he uses. You know, we're to be as not to be asleep. We're not to be drunk. We're not to be uh, unaware of the signs of his coming. We're to be spirit-filled. He talks about um, being sober, being alert. And, um, and then it gets into the armor, right? Because we're at war right now. We need to be using the armor of God. Where? Okay. Um, he shortens his list, but he, he hits on some important pieces of armor. We are at war. We need to be engaged in that battle using the equipment he's given us, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the gospel shoes of peace, the the uh, girding our loins with truth and and taking up the sword of the spirit and you know using the word of God to our advantage. Um, so therefore we are to what? Encourage one another, right? You know, God has not destined us for wrath. That is one of the most key arguments against you know, this post-tribulation mindset. That's why some people will go mid-trib. Well, that's when the wrath really begins. No, I'm going to be there the whole seven years. I get a full wedding week with my, my bridegroom, okay? But that's where the argument will come. Well, it's a pre-wrath rapture. Well, golly, it's a whole, I get the whole seven years. Um... <clears throat> And he ends with that, that going back to, so whether we've, we've passed away, whether we're awake or asleep, when he says asleep, that's a euphemism for having died. So whether we are alive for the rapture or we've passed away, it's all good because we're going to be with the Lord. And he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And that's one of the biggest arguments uh, waged against those who teach a post-tribulation and, and all this, that, that believers go through the tribulation. I don't, do you find encouragement that we go through the inter tribulation? That's not encouraging to me. I, I don't want to live through the book of Revelation. <laughs> signs and bowls and woes and all that. I don't, I don't find that encouraging. Okay, I do find it encouraging that my bridegroom comes and gets me and we have a nice party. Well, craziness is going on here and all of that. But it also motivates to bring as many people into the light and to wake as many people up as we can and, um, and that they can be prepared and ready, you know, because this day is approaching. Everything that he talks about that, that needs to be in place is in place. The imminent return of the Lord, it, the word is imminent. It could be at any moment. And so it needs to inspire us to take every opportunity to share the gospel and encourage one another. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the hope that you've given us, that our, our Savior is coming to get us. And, oh Lord, everything is in place. I ask you to give us opportunities this week to share the gospel. And I pray that you'd harvest all the more souls into the kingdom um, and that you come get us, Lord. Maranatha, just come get us, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.